session with Johannes Jakoboglu uh, from Burgund University. He's going to talk, well, you can see the title on the screen, please. Thank you very much. Good evening to everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be talking in this conference this week. I would like to address before starting a special thank you to all the organizers for making this event possible for all of us. So today I would like to talk about uh, the problem of classification of Anosov flows in dimension three and more specifically about a new classification tool that we call a Markovian family, which allows us to classify Anosov flows in dimension three, large families, families of flows in dimension three. <laughs> so my talk will be divided today into three parts. In the first part, I will be giving some important background definitions very briefly. In the second part, I will define what a Markovian family is. And in the third part, I'll give you some applications of uh, Markovian families to the classification problem. So following the steps of my predecessors, uh, I will not define what an Anosov flow is. You can believe all of you know what this is. Um, just keep in mind that today, all our Anosov flows are going to live in dimension three. So I will begin my talk with an open question. Uh, so it's a very classical and old open question uh, in the field of classification of Anosov flows. So give us a necessary and sufficient condition for a three manifold to support an Anosov flow. Even though the question is pretty old, we don't know a lot about this. Uh, we do know some things. There are some necessary conditions. Uh, for instance, if a manifold M has an Anosov flow on it, then its fundamental group needs to have exponential growth. And then the more recent result, uh, the fundamental group of a manifold supporting Nanoso flow needs to have a left orderable subgroup of index at most two. So for the purposes of today's talk, we'll be more interested in one, there's one more necessary condition that we're going to be interested in. So a manifold supporting a Nanoso flow in dimension three necessarily has a universal cover that is homeomorphic to R3. So this is what's gonna be very important to us today. And what's more, when I lift the Anosov flow on the universal cover, what I, what I obtain is actually a very simple flow. Up to orbital equivalence, what I get is a vertical uh, flow given by a constant vertical vector field. So what's, what's interesting about this result is that it's going to allow us to define the bifolated plane of an Anosov flow which is an object that contains a lot of information about our flow. So a very easy corollary of this theorem is that when I take the orbit space of the lifted flow on R3, so the lifted flow is a very simple flow. Uh, once I quotient by the relation of belonging the same orbit, what I obtain is uh, the orbit space, and this is homeomorphic to R2. And we call this the bifolated plane of our Anosov flow. So why is this going to be important? Because we want to reduce the problem of classification of Anosov flows to a problem of classification of group actions in dimension two. So this bifolated plane contains a lot of information and it turns out that it contains every, uh, all the information about our original flow. So let us see some properties of this bifolated plane. Uh, so we'll consider an Anosov flow on a three manifold and P is bifolated plane. So first of all, the reason why we call this a bifolated plane is because it has two transverse line foliations in it. Very naturally, so I take my original Anosov flow, I consider its weak, stable, and unstable foliations. I lift those on R3 and I obtain a foliation by planes in R3. And every each of those planes is saturated by orbits of my lifted flow. So when I quotient by my lifted flow and I go to the orbit space, what I obtain is a pair of transverse line foliations inside my orbit space. So the second very easy kind of remark is that the fundamental group of my original manifold acts by deck transformations on R3. Uh, and those deck transformations preserve my orbits of the lifted flow. So when I quotient and go down to the orbit space, I obtain a natural action of my fundamental group on the bifolated plane. And now the key theorem, the, the most important thing in our approach to the problem of classification of Anosov flows is the important, is this, theorem by Thierry Barbeau, saying that the bifolated plane together with those two foliations, so the stable and unstable line foliations, and this natural group action by the fundamental group of M describes completely the original flow up to orbital equivalence. 
So everything that we want to know about my original Anasa flow, we can find all this information inside this action. So if one wants to classify Anasa flows, it suffices to classify actions by three manifold groups on the plane preserving a transverse pair of foliations. So from one side, working with a bifoliated plane uh, allows us to, to reduce the problem to a problem in dimension two. The problem now is that we had to pay the price. Uh, we went from a flow to a group action in dimension two. But this is not a problem. So what is our approach to classifying those actions? So we'd like to classify flows by classifying those actions. And our approach to do that is actually by considering Markov partitions of those actions. So usually we define a Markov partition for a Z action on some, on some space. Uh, in this case, I will use, uh, will define a Markov partition for a group action on the plane. And what I call a Markov partition is what we'll call for the rest of the talk Markovian family. So let us define this object. A Markovian family, my bifoliated plane, will be a set of rectangles as for any Markov partition. This set of rectangles is going to cover the whole bifoliated plane. And then I will need three axioms. The first axiom is a finiteness axiom. So usually for a Markov partition, we ask for a finite number of rectangles. So in this case, I will ask that my Markovian family is a finite number of orbits. So remember, we had this natural action by the fundamental group. So I will ask that my Markovian family consists of a finite number of rectangles up to the action of the fundamental group. My second criterion, uh, and this is where the Markovian comes in, every two rectangles of this family intersect in the Markovian way. So what I mean in the Markovian way is that there are types of intersections that will not be allowed. So this is an example, for instance, if I have this kind of intersection, I will not allow this. If I have this kind of intersection, this also will not be allowed. So if you want to know what is Markovian and what is not, you need to check if there is a corner of some rectangle that is contained in the interior of another rectangle. So this is pretty much what decides if it's Markovian or not. So for instance, this intersection is completely fine. Or this intersection is also completely fine. So we want that every pair of rectangles intersecting, either they have an empty intersection, in that case, we're very happy, or they intersect like in a Markovian way. Yeah, like the, the corner of this rectangle is in the boundary. I don't want it to be in the interior. That's my condition. Okay. And now there's a third condition. So usually when you consider a mark of partitions for flows, you have some kind of axiom stating that there is a finite return time on your Markov partition. The problem now is that we're working with Markov partitions for group actions and asking for a finite return time has not a lot of meaning. There is a way of making this work and it turns out that there is a criterion for finite return time in some sense, which is given by the third property. Um, so I'm going to ask one more thing about my family of rectangles. For every point X inside my bifoliated plane, I will take its stable and unstable uh, leaf. Uh, so I'll have the stable leaf. I'll take its unstable leaf. And those two leaves are going to define four quadrants inside my bifoliated plane. And for every of those quadrants and for every small neighborhood inside a quadrant like this, for instance, this very small neighborhood close to my point X, I will ask that the rectangle of my family intersects X and also contains this neighbor, for instance, this rectangle. So this is my third condition. Now this is going to be equivalent in some sense to finite return time. Finite return time. Okay, <clears throat> so let us directly go to an example. So I've drawn for you a Markovian family inside the before we plane of some Anasov flow. So we can see, okay, and I've not drawn all the rectangles uh, and I've not, uh, because the, we, it's gonna be very hard to see what's actually happening inside there. Uh, but you can see that all of my rectangles intersect in the Markovian way. There's no corner of some rectangle contained in the interior of some other. And I told you before, 
Markovian families can be used to classify anosov flows. So the magic here is that I can actually tell you relatively fast that this Markovian family is associated to a very specific anosov flow. So it turns out that this Markovian family is associated to the suspension of the cat map. Just by looking at this image, we don't need anything else. Um, so this is a Markovian family associated with the suspension of the cat map, and there's a group acting. So this is the fundamental group of uh, the suspension of the cat map, which is some direct part that of uh, Z2 basically. So how is this group acting here? So if you want to understand the Z2 action on this picture, so you start from this red rectangle and Z2 acts by translation of this picture. So it brings this red rectangle either here or here. And this gives you the Z2 action. And if you understand the Z app, the Z part here, how does this act? Well, it turns out that this Z part of my group acts as the cat map. So it transforms this red rectangle here to this very thin and long red rectangle here. So this gives you the complete action of my fundamental group inside the bifoliated plane. So I have a picture of how Markovian family looks like. So I told you we can use those to classify anosov flows. So I'm hoping directly to the classification result. So first of all, every transitive anosov flow in dimension three has Markovian families. <clears throat> not only does it have Markovian families, it has an infinite number of Markovian families. So this is not very difficult to show. Uh, you can take a Markov partition of your original flow. You can lift it on R3. Uh, and you can project this lift of your Markov partition on the orbit space. And what you're going to get is a Markovian family. So this gives you a proof of the first part. Now comes the interesting part. Um, Markovian family contains an infinite amount of information. Anosov flows up to orbital equivalence, there are only countably many. And a Markovian family is an infinite amount of information. It wouldn't be fun to classify a countable set by another countable set. So what we're going to do is to reduce all this information of a Markovian family to a finite combinatorial object. So the second part of the theorem says that every Markovian family canonically can be associated to a combinatorial object that is finite. Uh, and we call those combinatorial objects geometric types with cycles. So all the information inside the Markovian family is contained in this finite size object. It's a combina completely combinatorial object that contains all the information. And just by looking at this object, we can reconstruct the Markovian family and also the flow. And finally, every one of those objects describes my original flow up to orbital equivalence. Okay. So I will not give you a very precise definition of what the geometric type with cycles is, um, but I will show you on the previous example, what is the geometric type with cycles? So geometric types, uh, type with cycles consists of two types of information. The first one that we're going to need is the pattern of intersection of my rectangles. I need to know how my rectangles intersect. And the second part is going to be a finite set of integers. <clears throat> okay. So let us start by seeing how we can construct this for the previous uh, Markovian family for the cat map. So I claim that this is the pattern of intersection of my previous Markovian family. I'll try to explain a bit how this works. <clears throat> Let's go back some slides. Okay. <clears throat> I don't need to know what's happening inside my whole plane. What I need to know is what's happening inside the fundamental domain of my action pretty much. So I can, for instance, consider just seeing what happens on this red rectangle here, and then this green one. And then up to action, all those things are going to be transferred around the plane. But I don't care how they're going to move around the plane. I just want to see on this fundamental domain in some sense, what's happening. So what's happening is that there is a very thin and long red rectangle here that crosses my big and red rectangle here and crosses its top side. Then once it finishes crossing this red rectangle, it moves to, this, to another red rectangle and it crosses it completely from its lower side. 
And then once it crosses this red rectangle, it goes to a green one and crosses it from its lower side. So this is what this thin red rectangle is doing. And this is exactly what I've drawn in this picture. So you have, you have your two big rectangles, the red one and the green one. And now you have a very thin and long rectangle crossing first the big red along its upper side. Then it goes around and crosses it from its lower side and then finishes by crossing the big green rectangle from its lower side. It's exactly the same picture. I just restricted on a fundamental domain in some sense. I just don't care about the plane anymore. I just care about a fundamental domain. Yes, there is an orientation. Uh, we need to take care of orientations. So this is why my, my thin and red rectangle goes around like this and not like this, because it crosses from this side. Okay, so now I can play the same game with a green one. So my matrix A, so the, my, my cat map, transforms this green rectangle here to this long and not so thin rectangle here. So this crosses the big red along the middle part and then crosses the big green along its upper side. And this is exactly what I'm going to draw here too. My green thin rectangle is going to cross the red one along the middle part, and then it's going to cross the, red, the green one along its upper side. So the, the, the important thing about this picture is that we don't care about the size of the rectangles. We don't care if this green rectangle is a bit smaller or a bit larger, or if it's actually intersecting this side. This must be thought of as a combinatorial object. You need to think of this as just a combinatorial information. I just draw it out for you. But you need to think of this as a set of numbers describing where my rectangles are going. So we don't care about the drawing. The drawing is just a representation of the combinatorial object. So this is the first part of my geometric type with cycles, uh, the pattern of intersection. And it turns out that judging just from this, we cannot reconstruct the original Markovian family. Um, we need more. The reason why we need more is because this drawing, so for specialists, um, this drawing classifies, well, it allows us to reconstruct our original Anosov flow up to Dan Goodman free surgeries. Uh, fortunately, I don't have time to define what a surgery is, but think that this object is describing infinitely many Anosov flows that are not the same. So it's not enough to describe my original Anosov flow. And what I need in order to describe my original Anosov flow is to know the coefficients of those surgeries that I am missing for the time being. So I know for the time being that this classifies up to surgery and very specific surgeries, not any kind of surgery, very, very specific ones. But I need to know the coefficients. And this is a set of integers that is missing. So those are the cycles. So that gives you uh, the geometric type with cycles. Once you give me the set of coefficients for the surgeries, I can give you back the original flow. And actually, this is a much more general kind of uh, result. Every time you look at the geometric type, so this pattern of intersection is called the geometric type. And the set of integers, we call it the cycles. So just by looking at the pattern of intersection, so the geometric type without the integers, that gives you back uh, your original Anosov flow up to surgery, up to very specific surgeries. So it's not enough to classify any kind of Anosov flow. We need more, but it's, it's just a set of numbers, a finite one. Okay, so this is my object, and this is how we're going to try to classify Anosov flows in dimension three. Are there any questions to talk about? Yes. <clears throat> So your question, if you say, you say, if I see this drawing, how do I know that all the intersections are good? Of course, like you, you have plenty of choices. Not all of them correspond to Anosov flows. Some of them do. So we're going to talk about this in one slide. But all of them correspond to rectangles intersecting Markovian. That's fine. 
The problem is that not all of them correspond to anisotropy. Did this answer to your question? Okay. Um, we can talk about this after, uh, if you wish. Um, okay, so let's move to how we have use this to apply anisotropy in dimensional three. So here are some applications of this classification method. First, first interesting result, not all of those drawings correspond to Anderson flows. Uh, so there is an if and only if condition to be satisfied for the drawing to correspond to an Anderson flow. So given a geometric type with cycles, there is an if and only if condition for this geometric type with cycles to actually correspond to an Anderson flow. And this can be checked algorithmically in a finite time. So this is joint work with Christian Bonatti. Okay. Second part, um, so the, the problem with reducing the action into a fundamental domain of some sort is that we lost the action. Not only we lost the action, we also lost the group. So it's very hard a priori to guess what is the group acting on the Markovian family that we don't even see. <clears throat> we just see its fundamental domain. We don't know, even know the group. So the second part, uh, so this result says that if you give me a geometric type with cycles that is associated to some anisotropy flow, I can recover the group algorithmically. I can recover a presentation of the group algorithmically. Um, so I can recover the group and I can reconstruct the original uh, Markovian family. And by combining the first and the second result, in an infinite time algorithm this time, I mean, we can generate all geometric types with cycles that correspond to anisotropy flows. And for each one of them, I can find the group. So it gives me an infinite list of all fundamental groups containing transitive anisotropy. And finally, uh, which that was the, the objective of the talk, using geometric types with cycles, we can classify large families of anisotropy. And this is we're going to talk about the next slides. So this is our hope right now. This is, uh, this is our conjecture right now and our goal. Uh, we would like using geometric types with cycles to classify all transitive anisotropy flows with at least one transverse torus. So we're not able to do that yet, but what we're able to do is to classify progressively large families of this type. So let me start by uh, defining a uh, class of flows, uh, which is very well known uh, today. So we'll consider an anus of flows on graph manifolds. And we will say that our anus of flow is uh, totally periodic if for every cipher piece in our graph manifold, there is a periodic orbit of our flow that is freely homotopic up to powers uh, to some fiber of my cipher piece. So basically, you take a graph manifold or your JHJ uh, pieces are ciphered, and out of all the infinite periodic orbits of your anisotropy flow, you want that for every piece, there is one periodic orbit that is homotopic freely to some fiber. So every, uh, basically every ciphered, uh, every JHJ decomposition, like every JHJ piece is ciphered. You don't want hyperbolic pieces. Um, so this is our condition. We, we, uh, we want that in every JHJ decomposition piece, every ciphered piece, there is a periodic orbit that is freely homotopic to some fiber. And that's it. And also flows have many orbits. <laughs> I mean, it could work out. Um, so it turns out that this is a very large uh, family of anisotropy flows. It contains the bonatti langevin original flow and all of its generalization by Thierry Barbeau. And also it turns out that this family um, has been classified by Barbeau and Penley in 2012. So we can, we can suggest a different way of classifying by geometric types with cycles. So here's the result. Uh, polyperiodic transitive anisotropy flows can be completely classified by geometric types with cycles. So we can use our invariants to classify completely this family. And what I mean by completely is that given any flow, any totally periodic transitive flow, anisotropy flow, 
I can give you canonically a finite number of geometric typeless cycles. Not only I can give you canonically this family of geometric typeless cycles, but I can also algorithmically decide whether a geometric type is canonically associated to a totally periodic anisotropy. And if you give me two geometric types with cycles, I can algorithmically decide whether they correspond to the same totally periodic anisotropy. So it gives us a second complete uh, classification of this family of flows. And what's, what I consider an advantage of this classification is that a priori, it, it does not depend a lot on the totally periodic condition. We don't need that much to classify. It turns out that we need less. And in the joint work in progress with Christian Bonatti, we're currently classifying larger families than the totally periodic uh, Anasov flow family. Um, containing, again, like transverse story, um, but by generalizing the methods that we use in the proof of this theorem. So the proof of this theorem does not depend a lot on the totally periodic condition. It depends only on the form of the bipolar plane. And this, this approach can be generalized. So our goal, once again, is to get to this conjecture and classify all transitive Anosov flows in manifold, in three manifolds that have a transverse uh, torus or quasi-transverse source. So we're not yet there, but we're getting progressively more and more close. Uh, that's gonna be the end of my talk. Thank you very much for the attention. <laughs> yes. We can actually. Uh, so there was this question um, asked by, by Pierre Dornois recently, and he told me, how many different flows can you construct just by two rectangles? So in this drawing, you can see I have plenty of rectangles, like uh, the Bonatti Langevin flow has one, two, three, four rectangles that are needed. Uh, I, I guess maybe we can do better, I don't know, but. Uh, Pierre asked me, can you do Anasov flows? How many can you do with two? So his guess was that you can do only suspensions. It turns out that no. There are many, many Anasov flows that can be described by geometric types with cycles, just with two rectangles. We don't know which ones. I don't know if they're known, if they have a name, but we know that this is a class of Anasov flows that is much bigger than uh, the suspensions. You can, but in theory, I mean, I don't know, like you can, I can, I can draw the simplest one. I, so this is, uh, this is an example of the new Anasov flow that we don't have a name for. The lava flow. It's not a suspension. What is it? I don't know. I haven't checked actually. Yes, I, I, I need to check. It would be very interesting to see. Very nice question. So this is actually a question we started working on with uh, Christian this uh, week. Uh, <laughs> so we, we um, so there are some, uh, so what you can do uh, to construct Markov partitions for the geodesic flow. So Pierre Dornois gives specific surgeries to go from a suspension flow to a geodesic flow. Then you can take a Markov partition in the suspension whose only periodic orbits in the boundary is given by those orbits on which you're going to do surgery. And then you transfer it to the geodesic flow. But it would be very interesting to have actually a very specific image of this. But this is a way of constructing. No. 
so it's it's actually an open question right now. There are cases where we can say that it's clearly the same, and there are cases with, where it's very difficult to say if it's the same flow or not. So the geometric types can can be completely different. Uh, in the case of totally periodic, the canonical ones that I'm constructing have always the same form. So it's very easy to judge if it's the same flow or if it's, uh, if it's associated to some uh, totally periodic anisotropic flow. So for the geodesic flow, we, I don't know, 